Welcome to the forge, my wanton wildlings. I'm your creepsmith, and I hope you like my work. Have you ever seen one of those couples who just seem too perfect together? Ever catch yourself wishing ill of them in reaction to your own jealousy? Or is that just me? When seeing people like this, it often fails to occur to us that maybe, just maybe, that effusive bond that they share is due to weathering their own curses, surviving their own trials. Remember that during tonight's Halloween prequel, The Third of Three Hollows. Of course, titled Hollow. Author unknown. And yes, b before you tell me, Lady McCreepsta did it better. I know. She was beautiful. She and I would sit with my laptop for hours on end looking for the scariest things we could find. It was an odd relationship, but it worked. Something just clicked when I was with her. She was the love of my life and my best friend. Nowadays, I'd give anything to have her back. She knew about the things I'd seen. I mean, she dismissed it. Ah, Jordan, it's just your mind playing tricks on you. I wonder if she still thinks it was just my mind. Really, she was always worried about me. I suppose that when you look at it from her perspective, the perspective of one who hadn't lived the way that I had, who hadn't seen what I had seen, it would rationalize her train of thought. It would make things make sense. Sometimes I wonder if she thought that I was insane. Sometimes I wonder if she thought I was insane. Okay, I know there were times when she did. The love in her eyes, when we lay together, when we made love, and when we scared ourselves silly, I just knew that it was because of that love that I would never lose her. She was mine, till death did us part. I really, I really don't know how to describe the things I see. Beautiful, lumbering, graceful, damned, hateful, loving. I wouldn't be wrong in saying slender. And that's no illusion. Just as damned as the drunk that walks down the street from the bar each night, scratching his sickly face and adjusting the old worn hat on his head, only to have it fall on its slant once more, just moments later. Just as loving as a mother to her kin. They're us, essentially, with long, cracked-looking limbs and expressions that can be both grotesque and beautiful. They're young and old, just as we are, and they're all varied greatly. Again, just as we are. They're the walking souls that never lived. Not unborn, not undead. I've been seeing them for three years now, in numbers just as great as humans. They are their own society, treating us as though we don't exist. They don't behave as we do, however. And I told her and saw fear in her eyes, not of beings of which I spoke, but for myself and my mental state of being. She loved me, but alas, she couldn't see. Seeing was believing. There was a day about two months ago when I walked with her. The same route that we'd walked a thousand times before. We lived on a circular road and often made the loop together while talking. I'd noted that Although the loop was our usual route, there'd only been one route that we'd completely avoided in all those months that we were lovers. It was the road the mayor lived on, Bow Water. 
This particular day, I suggested to her that we walk up through Bowwater, as I'd never gone far enough to reach the end of the street in question. She devoutly refused and explained that there was a night long ago when she was followed down that road by a large, black, burly figure of insurmountable height. Now, knowing what I've seen, she also dismissed any notion of paranormality. I was unconvinced, but I left well enough alone, and we continued on our usual trek. I really should have seen this coming. <sighs> but we were so vulnerable. Julia called me one night, a uh, morning around 3 a.m., to be precise. She told me that she was scared, that she was seeing and hearing things. She needed to talk. I stayed on the phone with her for two hours, just trying to calm her down as much as I possibly could. I did my best. It almost worked. She was dozing off, and I was happy to hear it. I was really tired, too. And then there was a thump. It was almost like a footstep, but not quite. I couldn't hear it really well over the phone, but I could tell that it wasn't a footstep. Wait, um, Julia, back to that. After the thump, I heard her stop breathing. I panicked and said her name twice. She cut me off the third time with a scream. I heard a commotion, heard her running, I heard the door slam and lock, and then I heard more running, and curtains moving. I yelled her name a couple more times. Julia! Julia! I said. Jordan, don't go. Please, please don't go, came the reply. It's okay, I'm here, what's wrong? She's out there, in the hallway. Who's in the hallway, Julia? I don't know who's in the hallway, Jordan. It's just a she. It's white. It smiles with its eyes. She smiles. She. Julia. Jules, calm down. Calm down. What is she? I, I don't want to talk about it, Jordan. I can't describe it. I just want to forget. Talk to me, Jory. Talk to me, please. About anything, just not that. But there was a reason that I wanted to know. I wanted to know because I've never seen one inside a house. Until the night before that. What I had seen was... Well, it was unlike everything else. Everything else had remained very humanoid, to an extent. This... This was like a mafia murder gone wrong, like someone had stuffed her body in a suitcase and left her alive to grow that way. Her face was smiling, and it was sickly black. It was a sickly black toothless grin with wide white bloodshot eyes. A black object that looked to be a horn with a ball end extended slightly from where her nose would have been. What sickened me was that her face was hanging. I mean, literally hanging from this ball-ended horn. It was like a child's Halloween mask. The gap between her face and her head was held together loosely by blood-soaked skin stretched to purple like tiny little slimy rope ligaments. Her face wriggled and spun loosely, hanging by the ball end and ligaments, marking small squelching noises when she moved. Her arms stretched under her legs and bent with four joints to each limb, behind legs of some sort. It was like some kind of sick, disfigured child was trying to play leapfrog. Her legs were relatively normal, although I couldn't see them well under the pure white dress that she wore. The last defining feature of this thing were three grotesque humps protruding from her back. It was on my porch. I had 
gone to use the washroom and decided to turn the kitchen light on so that I could find the bathroom light switch. Our bathroom connects to the kitchen for some reason. I turned on the light and there was nothing. I went to the bathroom, finished what I had to do, and then walked to the porch to turn the kitchen light off. I was greeted by the sight of that thing as I entered the porch. It looked up, its head lulled sickly to the side, and it smiled at me. At that point, I was used to seeing things, but this creature sickened me so badly, I, I felt that instead of hitting the switch and making a run for my bedroom, I'd have to say the hell with it and run to the toilet to puke. I followed through with the former and kept my bedroom door locked for the rest of the night. I did eventually manage to sleep, but it was light and restless. So now I was sure that Julia was seeing exactly what I had the night before. I couldn't pressure her about it, however, or I'd scare her even more. I tried to talk gently to her and to calm her down. Soon sleep was unavoidable and she drifted, allowing me to finally sleep myself. The days went by and Julia now refused to go near Bowwater Road. There was also a new path that she was staying clear of, a trail that we'd always used to use to cut through the park. She was hiding something, and I resolved to find out what. Soon after, I spent most days with her. The sweet summer air was a welcome change from the rain that we'd been experiencing. For the last week, I tried to ask her about that night, but she wouldn't talk about it. She just wouldn't say a word about it. We walked, and soon we went to my place. She wasn't so excited about our scary hour anymore, so we just cuddled. I swear to God, there was never a moment that day that I doubted she was the love of my life. We went our separate ways that night, parting with a long, lingering kiss. It was a, another reminder of our promise to one another. I told her to tell me if anything happened and that I'd be over in a second if she needed me. She did, after all, only live across the street. That night, um, she didn't say much online. I tried to elicit some conversation, but I was met with a bunch of nondescript oohs, ahs, and cools. Around 1.30 a.m., she went offline. At 2 a.m., I got a text and sighed with relief on seeing that it was her. The content of the text, however, set my stomach to unrest once more. I'm going for a walk. Sorry. I looked out the window to her house and saw not a single light on, not even her bedroom. I noticed her front door open and she walked or at least stumbled out, cloaked in her long pink jacket that was far too large to be wearing on a semi-cool summer night. I couldn't see her face very well. I tossed some shoes on and ran outside just in time to see her nearly disappear on the loop of Circular Road. I walked fast, keeping my distance and keeping quiet. When she stopped, I got scared. She was standing in front of the trail, the one that she'd avoided so heavily. She stood there for a good five minutes, and I almost moved to go with her before noticing that she was no longer alone. One of the things walked out of the trail. This one was different as well, but nowhere near as grotesque as the one that I'd seen before. This one wore a wooden mask. I, it was what I would have called a plague doctor mask. The long nose of the thing descended to its chest and it was otherwise cloaked in black. A long skinny arm reached out of the cloak towards Julia and she reached toward it, holding something in her hand. No. No, no, it wasn't a hand that she held outwards. It was a foot. My heart stopped. 
I knew. I just knew. I had never bothered to question the way that she walked as though drunken. I'd never even bothered to look at her feet or her hands. I looked down and sure enough, there were two hands with spindly long fingers stretched over the road in the street lights midst. My heart stopped and broke at the same time for I knew that the face that I looked at was that of my beloved, my Julia. I yelled. I yelled with so much force and anger that the plague doctor himself flinched. Julia turned and I got my first clear look at her face. Scared, regretful, dead. The plague doctor walked up behind her, grabbing the jacket from the front as if hugging her and tore it open. I was greeted by the girl thing from the night before, her body cozily hugged by my Julia's hollowed rib cage, for that a spine, a neck, and a head were all that was left of my beloved. I cried. I cried out to myself and to the things that killed her. I cried with rage and heartbreak loudly and angrily, and I began to run. I ran at them, glaring at that detached face and waiting for its stupid fucking grin to fade. I glared, waiting for the satisfaction I'd get, seeing the fear in its bloodshot eyes before I bashed its fucking skull in. It just smiled wider now. I made it under the street light, merely ten feet away from the thing, sickeningly cradled by Julia's body. When I was grabbed, I spun around to see nothing, but when I looked to my side, there was a bony blue hand holding on to my shoulder. I looked up, and there was another one of them. It was hanging from the street light, a noose tightened around its neck. Its face was blue and old, like the rest of it, and it was smiling. Unlike the girl thing, this being had no eyes. Rather, it had a crazy, wise glint in its empty sockets. Its feet were suspended three feet above my head, but its arms were disgustingly long, long enough to grab me. I tried to run to continue towards the killer, but those fragile-looking limbs held me tightly in place. I looked up again and cursed the stupid fucking thing for keeping me from killing the killer. Merely smiled a smile that would have looked encouraging on a normal old man, and for the first time I heard the voice of one of them. It spoke as it smiled, in an old man's soft voice. It spoke but one word before tossing me a good five feet back. I landed on my side, and a sharp pain shot through my body, temporarily paralyzing me. Then I got up and they were gone. All that was left was the hollow body of my beloved on the ground staring up at me sadly. And I ran. By God, I ran. I ran home. I ran home, snuck inside, and went straight to my room. I soberly reflected on everything that Julia and I had ever done. I looked back on all of it and smiled. That morning, I awoke with the firm belief that my beloved was alive and it was all a bad dream. I phoned her to let her know how much I loved her and how thankful I was that I'd met her in the first place. Her father picked up. He told me that her body had been found two hours ago by the park trail. I hung up and proceeded to break down. It's been a month since she died and I still think of what the hanged creature told me that night. Just one word. Samhain. See, when the little kidlets say trick or treat, one wonders 
how much we've forgotten down the years. I really hate the marketing industry some days. So stay scary, wildlings. Remember, it doesn't hurt to brush up on your history or your mythology and make the most of your nights.